Honourable Senators, I rise today to speak to the second reading of Bill C-7, Medical Assistance in Dying. To begin, I wanted to address the language used in this debate. Academics and experts have built a whole parallel vocabulary to distance us from the reality of assisted suicide. It should be called medical assistance in dying, they insist. But it isn't assistant, assisting in dying when death is not imminent or reasonably foreseeable, as in Bill C-7. It is assistance to die. Assisted suicide is asking the state to end a life. And that life, that person, is not a case of maid. That person is a life gone forever. No matter where you stand on this issue, we cannot lose sight of the gravity of that. This is exactly why we cannot and must not rush the deliberation of this bill, honourable senators. Because this bill is so important to Canadians, our Senate Legal Committee proactively conducted a significant pre-study on the subject matter of extending access to assisted suicide like in Bill C-7. We heard from 81 witnesses, almost 30 hours in five full days of hearings from all sides of this issue. Senators who have been here for many years have never seen anything like this. Almost none of those 81 witnesses from either side agreed with the approach the federal government has taken here. Witnesses told us about the substantial widespread concerns they had on all aspects of this matter, the likely unconstitutionality of this bill, the lack of consultation with the disability community and Indigenous voices, the proposed, the proposed removal of safeguards, and the Trudeau government's rush to expand assisted suicide to those who do not face imminent death while forecasting expanding access further in the near future to include people suffering with mental illness as a sole underlying condition. There are so many problems with this bill, it is difficult to squeeze them into 15 minutes. So today, I will focus on the two I found most concerning. The effect Bill C-7 on Canadians living with disabilities and Justice Minister Lametti's hint when he appeared before us that the exclusion of mental illness from assisted suicide in Bill C-7 may only be temporary. It is surprising but telling that all of the major national disability groups are united in their opposition to expanding MAID as outlined in Bill C-7. Representatives of these organizations have stated clearly that if Bill C-7 passes as is, they will launch a constitutional challenge because this bill violates their Section 15 equality rights. Remarkably, even the three ministers who appeared before us, Lametti, Haidu and Qualtro, demonstrated only tepid support for Bill C-7. And it's notable that former Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould, who guided the first assisted suicide bill, uh, C-14, through Parliament, even voted against Bill C-7 in the House of Commons last week. The Trudeau government has ignored the disability community on this critical issue. When the Minister of Disability Inclusion, Carla Qualtro, appeared before our Senate committee, she referred to persons with disabilities who would qualify for assisted dying under Bill C-7 as a, quote, subset. It appears that Minister Qualtro's response was to suggest that the strongly voiced concerns expressed by leaders of Canada's disability rights movement might be overstating that actual risk. But that a Minister of the Crown would use wording that implies she dismisses a group of people, Canadians with disabilities who suffer grievously, intolerably and irremediably, as too few to matter, is shocking. However, it is indicative of the discrimination that people living with disabilities face under Bill C-7. Disability advocates and legal experts have made a compelling case that Bill C-7, which removes the requirement for reasonable foreseeability of death, would violate the Section 15 Charter Rights of Persons Living with Disabilities. Section 15 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees every person equal protection and equal benefit of the law and the right not to be discriminated against on several enumerated grounds, including on the basis of disability. Distinguished law professor Isabel Grant told our committee that a Section 15 analysis of Bill C-7 must answer two questions. First, does the bill make a distinction based on one of the protected grounds, that of disability? Clearly, yes. We know from the Eldridge decision that a law need not discriminate against all people with disability in order to be found discriminatory. It is beyond question that Bill C-7 makes a distinction based on disability. Some persons with disabilities, those whose suffering is intolerable, will be offered death as a solution to that suffering, while other Canadians will have their intolerable suffering met with suicide prevention efforts to try and restore meaning and hope to their lives. People with disabilities who suffer intolerably will be offered death as a solution. 
The second question we should ask under Section 15 is whether the distinction made by a law is discriminatory, that is, if it reinforces, perpetuates, or exacerbates the historical disadvantage or stereotypes experienced by people with disabilities. Bill C-7 perpetuates the stereotype that some people with disabling conditions are better off dead. Bill C-7 is discriminatory in the most profound and insidious way because it says to people with disabilities that their lives, unlike the lives of non-disabled Canadians, are not worth fighting for. It is no defence to a Section 15 challenge to argue that assisted suicide is not mandated, but rather only offered as a choice to those who want it. Much of the suffering of people with disabilities in Canada stems from social inequalities they can face on a daily basis. Poverty, inadequate housing, unemployment, lack of access to treatment, social isolation, the list is long. The Supreme Court Fraser decision this October stated explicitly that, quote, differential treatment can be discriminatory even if it is based on choices made by the affected individual, quote, precisely because systemic inequalities shape what choices are available to people. The choice of assisted suicide may really be no choice at all. BC Aboriginal Network on Disability Society Executive Director Neil Boulanger wrote in a recent op-ed, quote, Rightly and without hesitation, we override the autonomy rights of homeless, Indigenous and 2S LGBTQ plus persons who are not living with disability, illness or disease, but who seek a premature death when their suffering becomes intolerable. We create policies and programs to help them live robustly instead. But in the case of persons with disabilities, the government suggests we should look into their eyes and say, you're right, people like you do have a good reason to die and we are going to help you make it happen, unquote. Lawyer David Shannon has quadriplegia. In a recent column he wrote about Bill C-7, Shannon reflected on how his life is meaningful and what someone like him would miss by choosing assisted death, quote, and truth be told, I have accomplished a lot in my life. I've crossed our great country by the power of my wheelchair, coast to coast. I've jumped out of an airplane at over 25,000 feet. I've made it to the North Pole and planted an accessible parking sign. I've written a book, performed in plays and on TV. I've received my law degree and been a human rights commissioner. And I am an Order of Ontario and Order of Canada recipient. I've loved and been loved. My proudest, proudest accomplishment is that I lived." Unquote. Shannon went on to write, quote, If Bill C-7 passes, words will be enshrined in law, signed by the Parliament of Canada, essentially saying, go ahead, kill yourself. We will help because living with a disability must be totally unbearable. Bill C-7 introduces legislation that will violate my human rights and the rights of all people with disabilities, yet no one seems to care, unquote. Honourable Senators, we have the power, right here and right now, to show that we care about the lives of people living with disabilities in our country. We cannot allow this government to make these Canadians second-class citizens under this law. Bill C-7 currently excludes mental illness as a sole underlying condition from an expanded MAID regime. Some claim that this exclusion is discriminatory and stigmatizing to people with mental illness. They have floated the idea of creating a sunset clause to allow further study into this issue. I am vehemently opposed to such a proposal, as are many medical and legal experts, because it will sunset the lives of vulnerable Canadians. There is a contradiction inherent in allowing patients suffering with mental illness as a sole underlying condition to access assisted death. The standard of care in psychiatry is to prevent suicide, to preserve life and to offer hope. An intense trust relationship between doctor and patient is required for the successful treatment of so many mental illnesses. We would be asking medical practitioners to break that trust and abandon suicide prevention measures in order to facilitate a patient's suicide. As many of you know, I am a family survivor of suicide loss. My husband, MP Dave Batters, died by suicide days short of his 40th birthday after struggling with depression and anxiety. I have seen up close the failures of our mental health system. There are problems of accessibility, costs, stigma and an utter lack of resources that stand in the way of people getting the help they need. The answer to those barriers is to fix that system, not to confirm a mentally ill patient's feelings of hopelessness and offer them the lethal means to suicide. The answer is certainly not to end their lives for them. Mental health professionals have told us that there is no consensus in the medical community about the irremediability or predictability of mental illness. Any access to MAID for mental illness as a sole underlying condition in the current environment is premature. 
This will never be resolved within a matter of months. As for whether the exclusion of psychiatric maid is discriminatory, psychiatric expert Dr. Sonu Gain told our committee, quote, evidence shows that there are significant differences with mental disorders that warrant treating them differently for maid. Failing to do so would be a discriminatory, quote. He went on to say, quote, pretending there are no differences between mental illness and physical illness for the purposes of MAID borders on, and I think I am qualified to say this, delusional. It is not about infantilizing anyone or removing their autonomy. It is about avoiding discrimination by ensuring we don't set evidence-free policy, exposing our loved ones to arbitrary assessments with no standards that can lead to their premature deaths, unquote. Because of the nature of mental illness, suicidality is often a symptom of the disease. We heard testimony that there is insufficient evidence to determine which individuals with mental illness are seeking MAID as a symptom of their illness. How could we, in good conscience, offer assisted death as an option in place of treatment? Unfortunately, as I know personally all too well, people die every year by suicide, more than 4,000 Canadians every year. In 2019, more than 5,600 died by assisted suicide in Canada. That was a 26% increase from the year before. We are in the middle of a global pandemic, where the solution to stopping the spread of COVID-19 has meant isolating ourselves from contact with other people. And that isolation, with the increased stress and anxiety of economic uncertainty and decreased social supports, has brought a shadow pandemic of mental illness. Suicides will continue to rise. There is a very high correlation between suicide and mental illness. 90% of people who die by suicide have a mental illness. And one of the major risk factors for death by suicide is having access to the lethal means to do it. Bill C-7 not only directly delivers those lethal means to suicide, but it also shifts the daunting responsibility for carrying out that choice from the patient to the impersonal state. One factor that frequently deters people from attempting suicide is the possibility that they might not actually die. Bill C-7 asks the state to assist to ensure suicide is completed. There is no return. It is precisely for this reason that we must maintain rock-solid safeguards around assisted suicide. Even the Supreme Court in its 2015 Carter decision agreed that the risks inherent in permitting a physician-assisted death can be identified and very substantially minimized through a carefully designed system imposing stringent limits that are scrupulously monitored and enforced." Quote, Senators who have been here for several years will remember how we wrestled with what those safeguards should be during our deliberations on the original assisted suicide bill C-14. Now, not even five years later, the Trudeau government seeks to remove many of those safeguards in bill C-7. This bill would remove the 10-day waiting period between a request for assisted suicide and the completion of the assisted suicide. This is very concerning, given that witnesses at our legal committee testified about the highly unstable nature of suicidality, telling us that patients may fluctuate between whether to live or die even within the same day. In closing, what we found during our intensive pre-study is that we have insufficient evidence about the predictability and irremediability of mental illness, a lack of consensus in the scientific community about the ability to assess capacity for psychiatric MAID, the specter of looming constitutional challenges from Canadians with disabilities who contend Bill C-7 is discriminatory and devalues their lives, and a lack of government consultation with some of our most vulnerable populations. We are nowhere close to a resolution on any side of this issue. As parliamentarians, we are bound to uphold the Constitution and protect the rights and dignity of all Canadians. We must take the time we need to ensure that vulnerable Canadians are protected. For all of these reasons, I will vote against this bill at second reading. Meeting. Our legal committee pre-study gave us a substantial and frightening preview of Bill C-7. Protecting the lives of vulnerable Canadians demands that the Trudeau government go back to the drawing board. I hope you will join me to send them that message. Thank you. Senator Pletch, you have a question? I would like to ask the senator a question if she would take one. Senator Batters, will you take a question? Yes, I will. Go ahead, Senator. Uh, thank you, Senator Batters, and thank you for your... Uh, for your remarks. Uh, I think overall you and I are very much, I should probably turn this way, uh, very much on the same side of, of this, this particular issue. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, if, if you would, Senator Batters, about the um, slippery slope scenario. You, you talked about C-14, um, and of course you were part of the debates, as was I, and then, as now, we were not 
debating on whether or not assisted suicide should be legal. Um, if we would have debated that, I think we would have both voted against the bill then, as we did. But, uh, but again, we are not debating on whether it's legal. I'm sorry to interrupt. Senator Batter's time is up. Senator, are you asking for five more minutes? Yes. Is leave granted, colleagues? Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, so we had some parameters set in front of us on C-14. Um, they are now being changed drastically, not because of the courts of Quebec, but because the minister and this government took an opportunity when they could have appealed a court decision, they took an opportunity rather than to bring in a bill. You, you talked about the former justice minister voting against uh, Bill C-7 now, and the present justice minister voted against Bill C-14 uh, because he didn't think it went far enough. So I want to talk about the slippery slopes, uh, slope scenario, and I want you to give me your opinion on it. Um, we are being asked, let's just approve a little more, and that's how far it will go. And yet, Minister Lametti has made it clear that he is an advocate of having mental health as the sole criteria. He has talked about having uh, mature minors uh, being allowed to, to, to ask for assisted suicide. Could you give me your opinion on, on where you see us going if we allow this to continue the way we have? Uh, I'm with you. I'm, I'm inclined to vote against the bill, uh, not because I'm voting against assisted suicide, even though I'm opposed to it, uh, but clearly because of the safeguards that are being removed. Yes, thank you very much, Senator Platt. And uh, yeah, to start out with, first of all, I, I really wish that the um, Justice Minister would have appealed that court decision. It was a lower court decision. I think a lot of people, when they hear Quebec Superior Court, almost equate it to the Supreme Court. It isn't. It's the lower court in Quebec. They didn't even appeal it to the Quebec Court of Appeal, which would have helped a lot to get some better clarity, because C7 is supposed to be based on that lower court decision, but actually many of the things that are contained in Bill C7 go much beyond what Truchon contains, including the removal of those safeguards, the 10-day safeguard. That wasn't in Truch Truchon that that should be removed. The two independent witnesses, that was not in the Truchon decision um, that that was supposed to be removed. So it was a very specific decision about a specific issue. And then, um, like you say, I think that the slippery slope is well in effect here, and it very much concerns me, particularly on those two issues you mentioned, on the issue of mental illness um, as a sole condition and on mature minors. And uh, you will also recall that we tried to put some additional safeguards into that first bill, C-14, at the time to try to safeguard as much as possible, even more so than now. So yes, that definitely concerns me that the slippery slope could continue, and that's why I think we need to make it very clear, and Canadians expect it to be clear. In fact, there are many Canadians out there right now that think that terminal illness is a requirement for assisted suicide in Canada, and it is not. So Canadians um, need to just really, I really hope that they are starting to pay attention to this very important debate, because it has the most fundamental of impacts, life and death. Thank you. Supplementary, Senator I have one more question, if I could, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Batters, you've been, a, you've been a champion of the mental health uh, issues. As a matter of fact, uh, I attended a banquet a few years ago where you were honored for uh, Point of order. Senatrice, there's a point of order. Sorry, uh, Senator Platt. Senatrice Dupuis. Senator Dupuis. Madam Speaker. Who does a senator address when he or she speaks? Senator Plett seems to be engaged in a dialogue with Senator Batters. He's turned away from the microphone, and you can't really hear what he's saying. So could Senator Plett please speak into the microphone so we can all hear what he has to say? <laughs> if you could. Uh, you could take the there. Well, Madam Chair, I'm not sure whether you want to rule on a point of order here because uh, it seemed to me that uh, Senator Dupuy raised this as a point of order. But certainly I want to accommodate her and make sure she can hear me. I hope she can do that now if yes, I stand like I this with the microphone. I will take care of your advisement. 
So. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Senator Dupuy, for correcting me again, as you so aptly uh, do and so often do. I certainly always appreciate that admonition. Uh, Senator Batters, as I was saying, and for the benefit of Senator Dupuy, I will repeat that. You have been a champion of mental health. Um, I attended a banquet with you a few years ago where you were, uh, you were honored for the work you have done on the mental health issue, and, and I think all, uh, all Canadians owe you a debt of gratitude for what you have done. So thank you, Senator Batters. But uh, tell me, we have talked about palliative care, and we have talked about the lack of palliative care in our country. Uh, the lack of, of resources and money that are being put into palliative care. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the lack of resources that we have uh, combating the mental health issue as opposed to just coming out up with a way of giving these fine people that have a long productive life or could have a long productive life ahead of them uh, giving them a needle or a pill that we rather work with them and, and, and help Platt. them uh, recover from their, their, their problems. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt once again. Your time has expired. Would you ask for another five minutes? Yes, if the Chamber will grant it to me. Is leave granted, colleagues? Please. Thank you. Thank you very much for those kind words. Thank you very much for those kind words, Senator Platt. Um, and yes, that is something that I have consistently tried to dr draw to everyone's attention. I, I find it actually very sad. Um, my husband passed away 11 years ago, frankly, in part because of uh, the significant gaps that existed in the mental health care system in Canada. And even for someone like Dave, who was, you know, we were well off, um, he had many advantages, he was a member of parliament, but, um, Despite all of that, if someone like him couldn't get good help, despite everything we tried, it makes me very fearful for people who have many more vulnerabilities than what we did. And we really saw the gaps that existed, and frankly, it makes me quite sad every time I see that uh, despite this many years and this much effort, um, many things are getting better, but the utter lack of resources that still exist across Canada in the mental health um, uh, mental health care resources is it's dire actually and uh, that needs to be and that's what we should be focusing on not giving people an easier way to choose that devastatingly final choice of suicide there's no return from that and so what we need is to provide these people help not um, an easier access for them to die thank you thank you